Hi, folks. So yesterday was May 12th, and it was Steve Winwood's birthday. I found out at the end of the day. My wife told me. And I have a quick little Steve Winwood story. Uh, 1986, I was working at a record shop here in New Jersey, Scotty's Records, old school, uh, you know, record store. And here's an interesting thing. Um, so in those days, one of the ways that they... Um, put together the charts, the billboard charts of the top sound, the top 100, whatever, albums and all that, included a survey of certain record stores. So not every record store, but they would, they had certain record stores they would call on the phone and they would say, hey, give me your top 10 albums, give me your top 10 singles, and you would give it to them. Now, so what ends up happening uh, in those days is that the record labels had sales reps who would call us up and they would ask us to put their record on the list. They knew that, that this record shop was a was part of this uh, survey. And so, you know, they'd be like, hey, this is Andy from, you know, you answer the phone, Sky's Record Shop. Hey, this is Andy from uh, Capitol Records. Can you put, you know, Barbara Streisand at number five or whatever. I don't think she, I think she was Columbia, but you get the idea. And they usually the funny thing is they weren't asking for anything crazy. Most of the time, the stuff they were, they were promoting was stuff that really belonged there. And you just knew like, uh, you know, 1986 or, you know, maybe I don't have the year exactly right, but I can remember when I was working at that record store, the albums that were monster sellers, um, Barbara Streisand Broadway album was huge. Uh, dire Straits, um, Brothers in Arms was massive. John Cougar, or John Mellencamp, whatever. Scarecrow, you know, there were certain albums. And I was there during the transition from vinyl to CD. So when I started working there, the majority of our stock was still vinyl, and cassettes were very popular. And uh, we had a small, you know, the the the, C, the the CD collection was sort of boutique at first and and in the time period that I worked there it, it became massive with blister packs and blah 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 anyway so we would get calls from these uh, from these record sales reps and sometimes they would do you favors so now I was just a sales clerk you know I was low man on the totem pole but at some point I'd been there long enough or whatever and I was able to ask for a favor which was um, and I guess this would have been Island Records, Poly, Polydor Island. I can't believe I remember this stuff. Polygram, I think, would have been Steve Winwood. And I think I, uh, and hopefully I'm not getting anybody in trouble by divulging this information. This is all fiction. None of this really happened. Anyway, um, so the rep called and I asked if I could get tickets to see uh, Steve Winwood. It was a double bill at Pier 84 in New York City. So in the fall of 1986, it was Steve Winwood headlining with Jimmy Cliff opening. So the guy gets me a ticket, a ticket with backstage pass. Now, funny thing is I went by myself, and this is something I look back on as being very strange. I guess I'm, I believe I'm a kind of an introvert. And the funny thing is, like, I can't even count how many concerts that I've been to by myself. And I know that's sort of strange. I used to go to movies by myself, too. I just don't want to be bothered, to be honest with you. But I guess that's its literally antisocial. I'm just not interested in socializing. So I just wanted to, you know, go, go to the concert. So, like, I used to go see Acoustic Hot Tuna in the same time period. I would just go by myself. Sometimes I would go to dead shows with friends. I would hang out with friends and do stuff. But but there was nothing in my head that made me think it wasn't that it was strange or somehow undesirable on a different occasion to just go somewhere by myself. So anyway, I, I go to this. Uh, so I get a backstage pass. They send it to me and uh, to go see Steve Winwood, Jimmy Cliff, which is pretty exciting. So um the uh, to get the day of the concert, the evening of the concert, I didn't have a lot of uh, time to work with. I forget if it was like a school night or what the hell was going on, but and I was taking the train to New York, and these trains that were running in the late '80s were still these really old trains. I mean, they had wicker seats and like electric fans on the inside. I mean, seriously, like Humphrey Bogart should have 
uh, like been kissing someone goodbye on the at, on the platform to get on one of these stupid trains. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because uh, the train broke down in, uh, on the way in Summit, New Jersey, I think. Train broke down, and it was just sitting there, uh, delayed for some long period of time, long enough that by the time I got to um, the venue, I completely missed the uh, the Jimmy Cliff show, uh, which is kind of a bummer. I never did get another opportunity to uh, to see Jimmy Cliff, so that would have been uh, pretty cool, uh, but it wasn't meant to be. I did get there in time for the uh, for the Steve Winwood show, and Steve Winwood in '86 was really uh, riding high. I mean, uh, you know, Pier '84 is not exactly Madison Square Garden, but but he had a bunch of hits. If you remember, uh, he had uh, "Bring Me a Higher Love," and uh, I forget there was some other ones too. He had a hit record, and uh, you know, he was rocking the the '80s mullet and the uh, the Miami Vice like jacket T-shirt look, sort of like the way Clapton was at that time. And a lot of these sort of British invasion guys were having like one last big hurrah in the late 80s. But I was always a big fan of Steve Winwood. I liked his solo work. And I was thinking about like traffic and how I had, you know, I'm sure I had uh, on the vinyl, I had the low spark of high heeled boys. And I was just remembering this morning, the traffic album that I really loved was was John Barleycorn Must Die. That song, Empty Pages. I remember I used to listen to that song like in the morning before going to school and I would listen to Empty Pages. Uh, really, really liked that song. And, uh, you know, so he had a ton of hits with the Spencer Davis group and all that stuff. So go to the show. It's fine. It's a good show. I went to a bunch of shows at the, that Pier 84. And so I got a backstage pass. Now that's after the show. So, and I don't even remember how I figured this out, but there was somewhere there was, you go in a line and you wait in a line to be let in backstage. And so uh, I'm waiting in the line backstage and who's right uh, next to me, I think behind me technically, in line was um, Branford Marsalis. And... Uh, he was uh, he was wearing a Mets hat and he was asking about the Mets. He asked me, did I know if the Mets won? Because I guess there was a I could go back and look up the dates and and put all the missing pieces of this story together. But I think there was 86. The Mets were in the World Series. So I guess by the middle of September now, like they don't do it till who knows when. But I think they've added right because of expansion. They've added all kinds of stuff. But so I'm. Um, I don't know. Or maybe they were in the playoffs. I have no idea. But I remember him asking about the Mets. He wanted to know, did the Mets win something? And I don't care about the Mets, so I didn't know. And uh, and then I, I know I chit-chatted with him a little bit because I, uh, I learned from him in conversation that he was there to see, I forget her name, but one of the uh, backup singers in uh, Steve Winwood's band uh, on that tour had been one of Sting's backup singers in the Blue Turtles when Sting had not that had, around the same time period had done Sting in the Blue Turtles and Branford had played in that band. So, um, and this is, I think before Branford was even hooked up with the dead. So I think when I, um, I don't think there was any Grateful Dead connection at that time with Branford and it was just something that, and Jerry was 86. So Jerry was out of action in the fall of 86 so it's kind of interesting when you think about it. But Branford was really cool and, and, uh, and you know, uh, friendly, just like a dude waiting in line. And then, the, you know, that's it. I, I, I get let in backstage. You know, I'm looking around and I see Steve Winwood. I think he's pretty tall, if I remember right. And it's funny, too, because, you know, so I was like whatever I was, 19 or, or uh, something years old. And uh, 18, 19, and 18, I guess, so going on 19. And, uh, you know, these guys seem like big adults. You know, now I'm I'm 52, and I'm thinking he was like 40 or something probably at the time. Winwood, he looks fresh-faced to me now. <clears throat> it's only going to get worse from here as far as that goes. But anyway, uh, 
So I just walked up to him. I didn't have anything for him to sign. I've really never been into autographs. It's interesting. I'm not into autographs. I'm not really into photos either. I have like, I, I always kid around and say like, I just leave a smoking pile of wreckage behind me because I don't have maybe my 20s. I may have two or three photographs of myself from, from that whole decade. Um, I don't know. Anyway, I just go up to him and, uh, hi, Steve, you know, I really enjoy your music and uh, thank you and really appreciate it. And he was a very fine, uh, fine English gentleman. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <laughs> it's very nice. And that was it. I left and, uh, and I got my train out of there. So I don't know, maybe kind of a boring story, but uh, what the heck? Uh, now I've told it. So that was uh, how I met uh, Steve Winwood and Brantford Marsalis back in 1986.